Okay, following on from our video last week about the escalation of violence, as promised, we're making a video today about self-defence. What regulates the law on self-defence in New South Wales is our Crimes Act, and in particular, Section 418, which we have displayed uh, for you today. And essentially, the first part of Section 418 says, a person is not criminally responsible for an offence if the person carries out the conduct constituting the offence in self-defence. So what that means, if you actually strike someone, push someone, hit somebody, or do some action against that person, um, you won't be criminally responsible if you're actually acting in self-defence. Now, subsection 2 goes on to say, it actually specifies what self-defence is, and it says, a person carries out conduct in self-defence if and only if the person believes the conduct is necessary um, to defend himself or herself, to uh, prevent or, or terminate unlawful deprivation of their liberty, to protect property, or to prevent criminal trespass. It then goes on to say that the conduct is a, a reasonable response in the circumstances as he or she per perceive them. So there's a couple of important tests here. The first is that if you're acting in self-defence, subsection 2 tells us that you must genuinely believe yourself that your conduct is necessary. It's not an option. It's not something that you might think about doing. It's necessary. You personally believe that you must act to defend yourself, another person, your property, or to prevent somebody being detained, but it's necessary for you to take that action. Down the bottom of subsection 2 it says, and the conduct is a reasonable response in the circumstances. That says not only must you believe that your conduct is reasonable, a, a reasonable person in the same position as you must also believe that that conduct is, is reasonable. Now, thankfully, Section 419 of the Crimes Act states that the prosecution must prove beyond reasonable doubt that you weren't acting in self-defence if you or your lawyer raise that you're acting in self-defence in court. So the burden of proof is carried by the prosecution. They have to prove that you weren't acting in self-defence. Now, there are some key issues, um, and we've covered some of them. So when, when they say, if a person believes, that's a subjective test. So that means what you personally believe. Um, necessary, well, this is where I have some difficulty with some of the lectures in combatives. It's going to be very hard for you in court to explain that your actions are necessary, particularly with things like preemptive striking. We must also remember that our actions must be proportionate. They must be a proportionate response to the threat. So for example, if somebody yells at you um, and they're angry or upset, if you pull out a gun and shoot them, we will all know that that's not going to be a proportionate response. Uh, that carries on to things like excessive force. Um, once a threat has been stopped, once the threat is no longer proceeding, you cannot continue on with uh, what you are calling self-defence because you may then be viewed to be the attacker. The threat must be proximate, so you must believe that the, the danger to you is imminent. This could happen at any stage very shortly. Um, the court will take into account things which are particular to you, so your personal attributes, your age, your gender, your health, and uh, in some cases, as whether you've studied martial arts or self-defence in the past. As stated, they will factor all those things in together to decide whether your response was reasonable. Now, um, we're going to do a few scenarios. So this is where I'm going to take off the jacket and roll up the sleeves. Okay, so to make the point, um, I'm going to be attacked by a thug with a knife. He's coming to stab me. I block his arm, hit his face. Of course, at this stage, I'm justified. That would be reasonable force. He's still got the knife. He's still struggling. But I wrap him up and I force him towards the ground. He's still struggling. Now, at this stage, if I couldn't get the knife and I still had felt in threat, of course, I'd probably be justified in kneeing him, hitting him, doing things to try and make him let go of the knife and to save my own life. Now, I'd probably still, and I say, would be justified taking the knife. But if I then decided to go out quieter and start sawing his head off, or start shooting him in the back, every reasonable person would probably form a view at that stage that I was being excessive, and I was going from being the attacked to the attacker. Okay, so another obvious scenario, somebody comes and they confront me with a firearm, and of course, uh, this is a lethal weapon, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid for my life and my welfare. 
I'm clearly justified in seizing that weapon. I'm justified in administering a blow, in taking that weapon. And if he's still moving forward, I could then use that weapon to hit him. Where it, most people would consider it goes over the top if I then ratcheted the gun and put a couple of slugs into the offender, most people would consider that excessive. Now, of course, um, these scenarios today have been very black and white, and we concede, we're the first to concede that there are many, many grey areas, but that's what courts are all about. That's where these grey areas are argued every single day. What our respectful advice to you is, if you stay well and truly uh, on the side of what's reasonable, you are unlikely to have to go to court to spend those uh, tens of thousands of dollars to argue whether you were justified or not. Thank you.